Hey, I'm Mike, and today I'm going to tell you why America is never going to adopt the metric system. Now, you may say it's a pretty bold statement, but I think I have a little experience on the matter. I'm a chemical engineer. I've worked both in the U.S. and Europe, and honestly, I can tell you that living in Denmark, the hardest thing isn't the language, the weather, it's the damn metric system. America is never going to change, and I'm going to tell you why. So, where does the metric system come from anyways? Well, like almost everything in modern European history, it all goes back to the French Revolution. Back in the late 1700s, basically every country and even every little town had their own different sets of weights and standards. That meant that there was no consistency anywhere that you went. And the revolution was all about going to a new modern system that went away with the old ancien regime. The French revolutionaries wanted to go away from the old system that had a whole bunch of fractions and a bunch of different types of weights and measures for different things. They went so far with the calendar to even take it down to an even 10 months, each month having three weeks of 10 days each, each day having 10 hours, and each hour having 100 minutes. They loved the base 10 system. And so when it came time to doing distance, they decided that it should all be based on the distance from the North Pole to the equator. In fact, one ten millionth of that distance became the standard for the meter. So it made sense for the French to make that change because their current system dated all the way back to the age of Charlemagne. Here in Denmark, they actually had a change in the late 1600s where they developed a new system under Ole Römer, who was the chief mathematician under Christian V. And he set up a system that was based on puns and mills and fulls, and my favorite unit of measure, which is the tonner or the barrel. A barrel was actually a unit of area because it marked the amount of land that could be covered by one barrel of seeds. But back to France, you may think that once the revolution adopted the new metric system, that was it. It was all over. Well, this is one of the first examples of how hard it is to change people from their old system of weights and measures they're used to to some new and modern take. In France, it only lasted for about five to ten years before Napoleon came in and made some changes. He understood the value of a consistent weights and measures system, but at the same time, he didn't think that decimalization was all that important. He liked fractions himself. So he came up with a hybrid system that was able to help convert people over towards the metric system while restricting some of the terms and concepts they had before. So, given the fact that it came from the French Revolution, it came from Napoleon, you might think that the metric system marched across Europe the same way that Napoleon's armies did. But that's not the case. Again, it's really hard to change people's minds about weights and measures. In fact, across Europe, most of the countries that changed did so as part of either revolution or unification. Netherlands and Belgium adopted it as they gained their independence shortly after the Napoleonic Wars. In Russia, it didn't change until the Soviets took over as a way to overthrow the old Tsarist systems. And in countries like Germany and Italy, it was part of the unification efforts to mark a new start for a new nation that never existed before. You might also think that Denmark was one of the ones that started this thing as well. After all, it's a home of scientific progress and always seems to be on the forefront of history. But it's not true. Here in Scandinavia, the Norwegians went first, and they did so primarily to snub their noses at the Swedes that they were under at the time. In fact, it's said that this is one of the quickest laws ever to go through the Norwegian Storting. They only in a few days decided to adopt the metric system, partly to prove that they were ready for independence to be a nation of their own. So how long did it take Denmark to finally adopt the metric system? It took until 1907, and the adaptation of it didn't really start until the 1910s. So think about it. Here in Copenhagen, Niels Bohr was discovering the orbital nature of the atom, something that would win him the Nobel Prize at the same time he was going home to use the, the Pund and the Fuld, all these things that Ole Romer came up with in the late 1600s. Denmark, in fact, was one of the last nations in Western Europe to adopt the metric system. So I know you didn't come watch this video to hear about how different European countries adopted the metric system. You want to hear why America hasn't yet. And the truth is, it's not entirely our fault. And the reason for that is because there's one country that took a lot longer than Denmark to adopt the metric system. Our forefathers, the British. I mean, come on. The British, are they going to adopt some French-developed system of weights and measures when they have the mighty imperial system? Imperial meaning British Empire? Of course not. So for years and years, even as the metric system grew across continental Europe, Britain refused to do this. In fact, you can still see it today. If you go driving in Britain, you'll see it's not kilometers, it's miles that they talk about on the side of the road. And in fact, if you talk to people in the UK, if they want to talk about how tall they are, they're going to talk about how tall they are in feet and inches, how much they weigh. It's going to be in pounds, or maybe even stone. I don't even know what stone means. So it just shows you that the British still are as reluctant to join the metric system as the U.S. is. The difference, of course, is the EU. 
In the 1960s, the UK wanted to join what was then the EEC, and to do so meant that they had to be willing to be on the same level as their new partners. So during the 1960s and 70s, they developed into the metric system and built it in under the force of law. At the same time, you wouldn't always see it adopted everywhere. You could certainly go ahead and buy different products by the pound instead of by the kilo, but it was under the force of law. And now with Brexit, that's starting to change. So when you make fun of Americans for being the only country that doesn't use the metric system, remember, if you talk to a Brit, they probably think more on Imperial than metric today. After all, when you walk into an English pub, you're not ordering a half liter of beer. You're ordering a bloody pint. Cheers. Get out my pub. So I hope seeing how difficult it was for all the European nations to change and the fact that in the UK, there's still only a little bit of a change in the metric system helps understand why the US isn't maybe that big of an outlier for not being completely on the metric system. And it's also maybe a little bit of a lie to say that the US doesn't use metric. You find metric all over the US. I mean, as I was growing up in school, we learned more about the metric system than the imperial system. As an engineering school, we only operated metric or SI units. And honestly, if you look on bottles of shampoo or even a can of beer, you're going to see both imperial measures and metric measure. Part of that especially is because the U.S. is surrounded by metric countries. If you're going to market something in both the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, you have to show both sides. But then again, when's the last time you want to see how many milliliters were in your shampoo bottle? And all that is not to say that the U.S. didn't try to go metric. In fact, in the 1970s, there was a consensus that the U.S. was going to go metric to match the rest of the world. There were commissions set up and laws passed and signs were even put up on the roads showing both metric and imperial measures. It all went along pretty good. In fact, that's part of why when Derek and I were in school, we learned a lot about the metric system. But like many things, it came to an end with the Reagan revolution in the 1980s, as his eco-conservatives didn't want to keep funding some sort of system that was for wussy Europeans and didn't have the awesome muscular American methodology of using ounces and pounds and feet instead. And that's where the whole commission stopped. It was defunded and that was the end of metrification in America. And so that's where we stand today. This is the way that we're going to operate for the foreseeable future. At the same time, the metric system creeps in. If you watch a medical drama on TV, they're giving them cc's of medicine, not some sort of ounces. And if you go look at any kind of packaging today, it's going to have both metric and imperial system. So metric is slowly creeping into America, even though it's not the law of the land. And one place that we almost always run into trouble going between metric and imperial is in the kitchen. So maybe you don't know how many teaspoons are in a tablespoon, but one way that you can improve your cooking and that we've taken full advantage of is with the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community that you can join in order to take different courses and sharpen your skills in any kind of creative endeavor you choose. That could be culinary and in the kitchen. Mike took a course on how to make sourdough bread. That could be in self-care. We took a course from Jonathan Van Ness to learn how to relax more and be a little bit more hookah at home. We've even taken some courses in video editing, transitions, color correction, storyboards, things that have helped us in making our YouTube videos. So whatever your creative interest is, Skillshare is going to help you out by giving you a one month free membership to the first 1,000 people that watch this video and click on the link in the description. That's right, one month of Skillshare for free to try it out and join this online learning community that we've gotten so much out of. So with all that, do I think America is going to change the metric system? Probably not. My best guess is if at best it'll be a bit of a hybrid system like they have in the UK where maybe metric is used for some major transactions or in the scientific community, but day to day people still use the imperial system they grew up with. I mean, after all, America's a country with 330 million people. That's a big market, enough to justify having different packaging to be in ounces and not in milliliters. Also, you have tradition. I mean, when you get grandma's recipe, it's going to be in teaspoons and tablespoons and ounces, not in grams and decaliters. And that's hard to fight with. So when it comes down to it, metric might creep into America, but it's never going to become the law of the land. That's my opinion, at least. What's yours? Go ahead and put it in the comments below. Thanks for watching, guys. Hi, hi. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed learning why America just hasn't adopted the metric system yet. But keep it right here on Rope Trotting. We have these two videos right here for you. You can also subscribe over here if you haven't done that yet. And this button up here is going to be your link to a free one month subscription of Skillshare. Bye.